Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to episode 95 of the Social Media and Politics podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, political scientist at Loon University. Remember, you can connect with the show on Twitter by following us at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. In this episode, we're going to be breaking down the results of a brand new study called Political Advertising Online and Offline. And this study is probably the most sophisticated to date that compares political Facebook ads from the Facebook ad library and all television ads across the United States during the 2018 midterm elections. So altogether, that's 7,298 candidates across federal and state level races and over 370,000 pieces of creative analyzed. So definitely getting into big data territory. And I've seen a couple presentations recently by researchers using the Facebook ad library API to descriptively chart what type of ads are being put out on Facebook and who they're targeting. But this study is really impressive, not only in the amount of data, but also in the comparison with television, where a lot of money is spent. And through that comparison, we're able to understand more about what are the specificities of Facebook advertising in terms of who is most likely to advertise on Facebook, when and where are candidates more likely to advertise on Facebook versus television, and then the topic and tone around these advertisements. What are they saying and what are they aimed to do? And joining me in just a moment to break down the study is Professor Travis Redoubt. He is a distinguished professor of government and politics at Washington State University, and he conducted the study along with Erica Franklin Fowler, Michael Franz, Gregory Martin, and Zachary Peskowitz. So all in all, again, I think this is a fascinating study. Uh, I think it will become a seminal work looking at what is the role of Facebook ads in the broader advertising ecosystem, uh, who uses them, when and where are they placed, what is actually being said in these ads, what's their strategic purpose. It's all covered in this study. And one of the things I love about the podcast medium is the ability to get you these research findings as they come out. This study isn't published yet, but I'll link to the working paper in the show notes. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Professor Travis Redoubt. Again, he is a distinguished professor of government and politics at Washington State University. Professor Redout, thanks so much for taking the time out. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you. So first of all, congratulations on a very well-designed study, and I'm looking forward to dive into it as we go along. But perhaps you could start off by giving us a bit of background into the motivations behind the study and why you and your team decided to compare political advertising across Facebook and television specifically. Well, there are a lot of motivations. Part of it is just the spectacular growth in digital advertising that we've seen over the past decade. Um, I've seen estimates that just over 20 percent of total political ad spending in the last cycle was on digital. Um, I notice Facebook is approaching a billion dollars spent on political ads on their platform since May of 2018. But in addition to that, we were going to get access to so much data because Facebook was going to publicly release those data um, to the scholarly community. And so that was really exciting just to get in there and see what was going on. Right. And I think it's a it's a really important comparison because often, you know, in, in the social media research space, we sometimes get so caught up in examining kind of the difference between different platforms that we sometimes neglect offline media and, and television in particular. Uh, and of course, television remains a huge part of campaign messaging, but it has some key differences with social media. And one of the most interesting, I think, is the designated market areas or DMAs. Can you explain what DMAs are and how they might encourage some differences in political advertising versus is Facebook. Sure. A DMA or a designated market area is just the, the fancy name that Nielsen gives to a, a media market. And that's basically just the, the geographic area that's reached by the signals of a TV station. And they generally encompass fairly large geographic areas. So one of the largest is the Salt Lake City media market, which covers most counties in Utah and some counties in neighboring states. 
And so um, when you're advertising on broadcast television, then it means your your message is reaching a lot of people across a large geographic expanse. And it also means those advertisements are generally pretty expensive because you're reaching so many people. Facebook, by contrast, allows you to reach as big or as small of an area as you want. Um, you could target, you know, a single block in a neighborhood, or you could target the entire country. Facebook allows you to target ads by a congressional district. And of course, it allows for micro-targeting as well, reaching out to specific individuals. Right, because I think it's important, and, and we'll come back to these DMAs because I'm so interested in them. Um, they don't line up necessarily with electoral constituencies or even states, right? They do not at all. You know, it's the rare congressional district that is served by only one DMA. And so in a lot of places, it's quite inefficient to uh, advertise on broadcast television. Right. And, you know, because those are markets, you know, they, they tend to be highly competitive, especially during big elections like a presidential cycle where candidates have to spend a lot in order to buy a slot in these DMAs, particularly close to the election. So that drives up the cost of television advertising, kind of making the financial barriers for running for public office quite high in the U.S. And let's kind of use that to introduce the study's first expectation that financially constrained candidates are relatively more likely to advertise on Facebook. So who could we expect to turn to online advertising channels? Well, we'd expect candidates who are running in down ballot races. So for a county commissioner or a state legislator, challengers tend to be more financially constrained in the United States than incumbents. First time candidates, those who are not major party candidates, just in general, those candidates who are not on top of the hierarchy. Right. And um, we'll dig in later to the to the findings, but I want to keep going through the expectations. Um, so apart from asking who's most likely to advertise on each medium, there's also the question of when and where those advertisements would be placed. And this gets a bit deeper, I think, into the strategic aspect and goals of campaigns messaging. So can you outline how the timing and purpose of the advertisements we see on television and Facebook might be different and why that might be the case? Sure. On television, the goal probably 99% of the time is persuasion. Maybe it's name recognition, but that helps with persuasion as well. Mm. And thus, TV ads often ramp up closer to election day. Um, you want to get your message out there to people when they are voting, so it's top of the mind. Though, admittedly, there are some arguments for why you should advertise on TV early as well. But in contrast to this persuasion goal on TV, campaigns goals in using Facebook are multiple. There's fundraising, there's acquisition. So acquiring more email addresses so we can contact these people and phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And it could be mobilization, letting them know there's a campaign event or that election day is next week. All of that in addition to persuasion. And so on Facebook, it, you know, having someone's email address early on, that's definitely to your advantage because then you can ask them for money a hundred times. And so the timing is also different on Facebook because the goals are different. Right. Right. And I think we see that kind of in the some of the social media research. But again, it hasn't really been benchmarked to, to television thus far. Um one of the comparisons that stuck out for me was the one you make between online advertisements like Facebook ads and direct mail, which I think is interesting because the age of the technologies is so different, but you argue that their function is quite similar. How might online advertising function similarly to direct mail? Yeah, you're right. Direct mail is this really old technology, right? Um, but one way it's similar is that it allows for pretty precise targeting in the same way that online advertising does. And it's often used very successfully in fundraising, especially early on during the campaign. And so online ads can be used the same way. You target those potential donors, even if they live five states away from where your campaign is, not just, you know, potential voters in your district close to election day. 
Right. And then getting into, you know, one of the the most interesting aspects, I think, is looking at the, the topic and tone of these advertisements. And again, I think the paper does a good job of forming expectations based on differences in how these two uh, media operate. So here the audiences of the two media are, are kind of in focus, which relates back to these, these DMAs. Can you break down some of the key structural differences between the two media and how this might affect the topic and tone of political advertisements on them? Yeah, so one key difference is just that the the audience on broadcast television especially is a pretty general audience. It's a pretty broad audience. It you know, spans the, the age range uh, and Republicans and Democrats also, you know, of course, are, are watching the same programs. Now, not entirely. You can target by programs so as to reach, say, more men or women or more Republicans or Democrats, but there, there's still a lot of inefficiency in that targeting. And so campaigns will often use a, a more general message that's maybe aimed for that persuadable voter, that independent voter in the middle. Right. Right. And I, I don't want to be redundant because you already kind of touched on it. But, you know, this idea that TV might be better suited for persuasion in comparison to social media ads. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Sure. I, I think there's some good research and I think it's common wisdom that when you're combining audio and visual, you're going to better appeal to our emotions than just audio or just visual. And the other thing about TV ads is... Well, technically, you can skip TV ads. You can change the channel with remote control. Oftentimes, they are on in the background, and people are watching them, and they're kind of how we experience watching TV or at least broadcast television, whereas the online environment, um, we're used to skipping ads as soon as we can, right? <laughs> right. And, and that's why unskippable ads on YouTube go at such premium prices uh, and sell out quickly because they more replicate that TV experience where people are more immersed in that audio and visual content. Right. And there's, there's also the argument, I think, that, you know, People often talk about the attention of social media users being eight seconds or something, whereas TV has a 30 second slot generally, which is actually more time to actually make an argument, right? Oh, exactly. And that's why the format of online video is tends to be so much different than you'll see on TV. Um, they try to make sure they get the main message, you know, in the first couple of seconds or... Make sure that you're emotionally brought into that ad in the first couple of seconds. Whereas with TV, you've got more time in order to, I guess, develop that argument or develop the flow of the ad. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the, the data sources in the study. So for, for television, you use political advertising data from the Wesleyan Media Project. Can you tell us about that project and the type of data that it uh, collects? Yeah, yeah. Um, Erica Franklin Fowler and Michael Franz and I have been co-directing this project since 2010, and we've been purchasing tracking information from a commercial firm that monitors every single political ad that airs in all 210 media markets in the United States, Jeez. including uh, broadcast and national cable. And so... It, it's some big data sets, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and, and then we have a, a team of coders that characterizes each of those creatives on dozens of different elements, including their tone, the issues that are talked about, some of the, the visuals that you see in the ads. So we, we've really developed a pretty large collection of political ads and that information about when and where they air. So interesting. And then there's the Facebook ad library, which we've talked about on the show before, but I think you tapped into the kind of back end with the ad library API. What data were you able to glean from that? Yeah, we were able to download information on each creative, including um, spending information, at least in buckets, and crude targeting information, so some geographic information uh, targeting uh, the sex of the individual who saw the ad. And then we were able to human code a subset of those ads. It was hundreds of thousands. And then apply some machine learning techniques to code the rest. Yeah, super interesting. Um, 
And before we get to the findings, I think one of the neat aspects of this data set and, and the research design is that you're able to test within candidate variation. So can you outline what that means for the study's research design and findings? Sure. By focusing on within candidate variation, that just means we're we're controlling for the fact that different types of candidates might use the two mediums in different ways. So we're not comparing, say, what 100 well-financed candidates are doing on TV with what 1,000 poorly financed candidates are doing on Facebook. Instead, we're comparing those same candidates and how they're using those same mediums. Right. So you're kind of, as you said, controlling for the fact that it's the same candidate using two different media. Exactly. Perfect. And so if we can, let's kind of group the methods and, and the findings together in terms of what types of analysis you did and then what the main results were that came came from them. So answering the who question first, what were some of the main findings regarding differences and who was most likely to spend on the two media? So one important finding, I think, is that candidates who are running in those down ballot races that we analyze as candidates running for state senate or state legislature, they were much more reliant on Facebook than television than those candidates at the top of the ballot, those who are running for senate or house or governor. And so in essence, we think Facebook is allowing those more financially constrained candidates to make appeals to the voting public that they could not afford to make on TV. Right, which is kind of a positive democratic outcome that people who may not have previously been able to afford to run can maybe be competitive. Indeed. Great. So um, turning to the when and where, uh, timing turns out to be quite a factor influencing spending between TV and Facebook ads. What was the findings there? Yes, we found a, a huge ramp up in TV spending closer to election day, but a, just a very gradual increase in spending on Facebook as election day approach. And so I, I think this finding in one sense reinforces that notion that Facebook is for more than just persuasion. Candidates' campaigns are using it throughout the campaign to do different things at different times. Right. I want to kind of pick this apart a bit because I think in, you cite in the paper a lot of literature that that argues that the kind of effects of these persuasive messaging it only works for a certain window of time, right? There's a certain decay a couple of weeks after where that persuasion no longer sticks with the voter. Right. There is some good research out there suggesting that the effects of advertisements kind of, well, I wouldn't say completely disappear, but get much smaller as we get a week or two weeks away from people having seen those ads. Right. And so that makes sense that the television ads, which are sort of posited to be more persuasive, are ramped up close to the election day. And then if Facebook ads were to have the same purpose, we would also see that ramp up, but they don't seem to be being used for persuasion that much. Right. I, you know, we find a lot of variation in what they're being used for. Maybe you know, based upon some past studies, uh, another study we've done, maybe about a third to 40 percent of Facebook ads seem to be kind of persuasion ads. Uh, they tend to be the video ads, hmm. whereas the text ads tend to be more focused on the fundraising and the mobilization and the acquisition. Hmm. Interesting. And I was wondering if you've thought about a possible connection between the two media when it comes to timing. Like, might it be that campaigns use Facebook ads and the kind of analytics they get from them as a way to optimize their television advertising closer to the actual election? I think it's an interesting notion. I'm, I'm not convinced they are, though, just because of what I talked about earlier, that digital ads seem to be a distinct animal. They tend to be a lot shorter. Mm. They're designed to be uh, to capture your attention in those first seconds. I'm sure campaign professionals could answer that question better than I am, but I, I'm skeptical that they can you know, repurpose or test those digital ads and use them in that television environment. Right. Well, mark that down for a question for the next uh, campaigner we have on the show. Um, but then looking at the where question in terms of where these ads are placed, uh, I found the analysis testing the degree of fit between the DMA and the electoral constituency particularly fascinating. So could you break down that result? Sure. 
uh, we find that where the district that an individual is running in is aligned with the media market, then TV is king. But the more the district lines in those media markets depart from each other, the more common Facebook becomes. Right. And again, this for me is the favorite part of the study, which is like, it's a huge effect. If a congressional candidate runs in a district where the TV media market aligns perfectly with the electoral border, that candidate would spend, by your estimate, $890,000 less than on Facebook. And so my question is, kind of, how do you interpret this? Is it that TV is simply more effective and thus worth spending on? Or kind of looking from the Facebook side, perhaps... Facebook's value is primarily in that it fills the gap in the incongruency between media markets and voters? Great question. Um, I think at the very least, there's a perception that TV is more effective, that people are actually watching those ads, where there's still some more skepticism about that online. And that's probably just because we don't have as much experience with online advertising, right? Right. Um, that said, when TV becomes too efficient, when you're wasting a bunch of dollars advertising to people who aren't voting in your district, then something else does need to fill in that gap. And I think we've got some good examples from uh, 2018. Some of the biggest spenders on Facebook in the House campaigns were those who uh, we're running in congressional districts in the Los Angeles media market, which reaches about 20 different congressional districts. Hmm. And so it's highly inefficient for them to use broadcast television. Right. And then Facebook comes in because they can target the voters where they need to, where that media market doesn't necessarily serve their purposes. Absolutely. They can they can ensure that not a single voter who lives outside those lines actually sees one of their ads. Yeah, so interesting. So then there's content and tone where you find across a range of tests that Facebook ads tend to be less substantive, so less about issues, uh, but more positive in tone than television ads. And, and why might that be? And, and what does it tell us about the demobilization strategies and, and the backfire effect you discuss in the paper? Yeah, it seems you're more often speaking to your side on Facebook, or you're speaking to the audience that you want to speak to. And so you don't necessarily have to attack your opponent to motivate your side. Um, it gives you the freedom, in a sense, to run positive ads because you're speaking to people who are already agreeing mm. with you. Um, you don't necessarily have to convince those voters in the middle that the other candidate is inherent evil, right? You also have that control over who is seeing your attacks. And so you can make sure that those who you think might react negatively to them, those who might showcase that voter backlash, well, don't show them those ads. Definitely, definitely. And I think that's, um, that's interesting because we kind of tend to think, I think maybe shadowed by all of the Russian disinformation uh, scandals, that these Facebook ads are particularly negative, that that's where they can kind of not be, I guess, in a sense, held accountable, you know, before previously because of the Facebook ad library, that people might be shooting these really negative ads to partisan voters in a way that was out of the public eye. And I think that your study doesn't necessarily find that. Yeah, that's right. This expectation that um, online advertising is a complete cesspool. Well, <laughs> it's not as much of a cesspool as TV advertising is. Right. And I'd like to ask you about uh, just that point. It's something you mentioned in one of the paper's footnotes, but I think it's important to mention, and I think it's particularly smart that you uh, that you brought it up, is that um, your Facebook data comes from this public ad library, which is part of Facebook's move towards increasing transparency. And you mentioned that the very public nature of this database may affect the type of ads campaigns have been running. And so could you unpack that argument a bit? And do you think that the data might be different if you collected it when political advertising on Facebook was less public? Sure. Yeah, I, I wish I could study that question in a in a quantitative fashion, right? Right. Um, you know, my sense is that fear of disclosure has perhaps not changed what most candidate campaigns are doing. Um, candidate campaigns tend to be fairly conventional. They're hiring the same campaign consultants. There's some risk of voter accountability. But I'd be more curious in knowing if it has changed the behavior, this 
you know, now that Facebook is making these ads public, change the behavior of those various groups that advertise. And when I say groups, I'm often referring just to groups that are little more than legal entities who are Mm -hmm. um, among those who are making the most outlandish claims, who are running the nastiest ads. I don't know if there's enough accountability that can be exacted there or not, but it's worth thinking about at the very least. Definitely. And it reminds me of something um, that we talked about in episode 74 of this podcast with a campaigner, Adam Meldrum, about the midterms. And he was saying that because these ad libraries had become public, that he was uh, predicting there would be consultancies around scouting out what the opposition is doing and, and who they're targeting with this data, which kind of gets to that idea that that campaigns really think this is going to change to an extent the type of services offered to campaigns by looking at these ads. That's great. Super interesting. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, all right, a bit of a long question here, but um, it pertains to the concept of cost in in Facebook ads. And you're finding that Facebook seems to somewhat make advertising more accessible for financially constrained uh, candidates. And I wanted to ask if you have any thoughts about the sophistication or effectiveness of these Facebook ads. And, And what I mean by this is that while Facebook ads may be cheaper and thus more accessible to down ballot candidates or challengers, to be truly effective, they require a really large infrastructure, right? They need uh, voter roll data, commercial data, campaign polling data, creative and analytics teams, and so you know this huge apparatus behind them. So while the cost for broadcasting the ads may be cheaper than television, the kind of apparatus needed to use these platforms effectively can be quite high. So looking at all this data, were you able to glean any insights into the resources spending behind the ads and whether that might matter in terms of when and where they are placed? I think that's a great point uh, and a great question, and I'm I'm not sure we have results that speak directly to that, but my impression like yours is that that state legislative candidate isn't isn't going to be able to afford all of these high-paid consultants and campaign staff that a presidential or Senate campaign has. Right. That said, I think... Facebook does offer some tools through their dashboard to anyone nowadays that were available maybe only to a presidential campaign just a few cycles ago. Um, You know, that state legislative candidate, I understand, could now do A-B testing Mm. uh, through that Facebook dashboard and figure out which version of that ad brings in more money. And so... Um, in some ways, I think the platform is uh, allowing those candidates to use some more of those more sophisticated tactics or techniques without having to pay the high priced consultancy fees. Right. It's interesting because the, the actual advertising suite uh, can sort of optimize for you based on different algorithms and, and, mm-hmm. and such. Right. And I'm, I'm, t- I'm trying to think from a from a research perspective. It becomes very hard to test whether these ads are effective because, as as far as I know, you don't receive any type of engagement rates or video view rates from the the API or from the ad library. So, in that sense, it's hard to see whether um, a more professionally produced video, for example, is maybe above the median number of shares or something. You don't get that kind of likes and and share data, right? You don't get that type of information from the API. I think you'd need to you know, partner with a bunch of campaigns and let them allow the researcher into their campaign headquarters in order to execute a study like that. Which Good I'd love to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I may or may not have tried. Um, but uh, finally, the research question of the paper is both uh, prescient and timely, as there's been a big discussion about political ads recently and, and Twitter's decision to ban them. And so reflecting on the findings and your interpretation of them, do you have any thoughts regarding how limiting or removing political ads on social media might influence aspects of advertising on offline media? Again, a great question, and I don't think campaigns are going to stop advertising if uh, these online platforms were to disappear, but they may turn to some more traditional methods of campaigning. Maybe there will be more money spent on direct mail or GOTV or whatever, or maybe more money will go into the more targeted forms of TV advertising. And we set up the article with a comparison 
uh, broadcast TV, but there's also local cable TV, which can serve a much smaller geographic area. Hmm. Um, you know, it might be the western suburbs fit into one cable zone and the, the central city fits into another cable zone. And so that's much more precise geographic targeting. So absent social media advertising, I could see local cable benefiting from that or individually addressable ads on something like Hulu, for instance. Right. I'll note one other thing. There is somewhat of a natural experiment going on in Washington State, where I live right now, uh, where Facebook and Google have agreed not to sell ads to our state candidates because they basically say they can't comply with state laws regarding disclosure. Hmm. Now, and so the volume of ads in this state or statewide races is dropping dramatically, though some ads apparently have slipped through. Um, maybe they're not as, as good as they claim to be in stopping these, but it is somewhat of an experiment. I'll be curious to see what the consequences of that are. Definitely. But I think um, you and your, your colleague study has done a great job sort of mapping out uh, what are some of those those key differences between Facebook and, and the kind of major megaphone, which is which is television. So, uh, Professor Redoubt, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and, uh, and sharing your insights with us. Thanks for having me. I've just been speaking with Travis Redoubt, Distinguished Professor of Government and Politics at Washington State University. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. As the Christmas season starts setting in, especially here in Sweden, remember, you can always leave us a gift with a review for the podcast, either on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And make sure you're subscribed, of course, to get every episode directly into your feed. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Malmo. See you next time.